I met Dr. McKenzie when I went down to uh, UNM Medical School to meet everybody and give a talk and was, to be honest, immediately impressed with him. He's a, a really, really bright scientist doing lots of really interesting work. One of his main areas of expertise actually in the learning and memory field and how kind of cell networks create memories and engrams and things. Um, but since starting his own lab, he's come to the bright side of the world, you know, and started doing some epilepsy research. So very grateful to have him now in that field working. Um, he did his undergrad degree at McGill University up in Canada. Um, following that, he went down to do his graduate studies at Boston University with the late Howard uh, Eichenbaum and then Eichenbaum. And then following that, he did his postdoctoral work at New NYU Medical School with Dr. Gregory Buzaki. So he's got a really, really nice pedigree, learned a lot from these people, I can tell, and I think he'll give an excellent talk today. So at his request, we're not going to go through all of his wonderful credentials but they are very quite impressive and very grateful to have him today. So if everyone can give him a, a, a warm welcome. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Parrish, for inviting me here. It's really an honor. And this is actually the first time um, that I'm speaking about um, this epilepsy work outside of UNM. And so I'm going to be very grateful um, for any feedback that you might have. Um, and so epilepsy has been recognized as a disease for millennia. And there's even a description in the Bible of a man who brings his child to Jesus uh, to be cured of his epilepsy. And a miracle occurs, and the child's last seizure occurs at that moment. And how do we know in this description that is indeed um, uh, being epilepsy being treated? And we know this just from the etymology of the word uh, lunatic, that uh, lunatic is... Uh, uh, you know, translated um, from the Latin, which itself is derived from the Greek. And that you can see in each of these words here um, that we've got the prefix here meaning moon. And it's been recognized for a long time that seizure vulnerability comes in cycles. It used to be believed that these cycles occurred with certain phases of the moon. That's not true. But as you'll see later, there are cycles that are multidian and the monthly cycles are very common. And so I think that from a religious perspective, and also from a scientific perspective and a philosophical perspective, epilepsy is a very interesting disease because during the seizure, you lose volition of your body and you lose awareness and then you are revived. So what happens during this moment? In the ancient times, it was considered that your soul was being seized. That's where the word seizure comes from. Um, and in, in truth, we still don't have a good biological explanation and medical explanation for what is happening during the seizure. And I think that that Truth is really manifest with how the disease itself is diagnosed. It's diagnosed by the presentation of the seizure, not the cause of the seizure. And so you're probably familiar with a tonic-clonic seizure, where there's either sustained contractions of the muscle or rhythmic contractions of the muscle. And so clearly, you know, one of the manifestations of a seizure is a motor output, but that's not the only manifestation of the seizure. Um, there's focal seizures where the semiology of the event, which is the clinical manifestation of the seizure, will depend on where in the brain that seizure is occurring. And some seizures start in particular parts of the brain. Some start everywhere at once. Some start in a particular part of the brain and then generalize to involve the entire brain. Some seizures you maintain awareness throughout the entire event and other seizures you don't. And so you can see that there's a lot of complexity for the presentation of the disorder, but actually that complexity doesn't always map on to the cause of the disease. And in terms of the etiology of the disease, it's extremely diverse and there's large gaps in our knowledge. So about a third of the people who have epilepsy, it looks like there's a genetic cause. And actually, these are the kind of seizures that are the easiest to treat with medication. For another third, it's some kind of structural metabolic change, for example, with stroke or traumatic brain injury or infection. These seizures tend to be very difficult to treat. And then for another entire third of the cases, we have no idea where these seizures are coming from. And so epilepsy is not a disease with a common cause. There's many different reasons why the brain can seize. And so it makes sense that there's not kind of one size fits all in terms of this treatment. And indeed, as I mentioned, these focal seizures are very difficult to treat. And even amongst the focal seizures, there's a lot of different underlying etiologies. And the degree to which they can be treated with pharmacology differs according to the root cause of the seizure. And so if you can see on the right of this plot here, this is hippocampal sclerosis. And you can see that the majority of the patients who have seizures because of hippocampal sclerosis, and that means hardening of the hippocampus, um, those seizures are not treated with pharmacology. And so what can be done for these patients? Um, one of the main uh, 
treatment options and one of the oldest treatment options. Oh, excuse me. Um, and so you can see that it's, it's not for lack of trying that uh, seizures can't be treated, that over the course of the last generation, there's been a whole slew of different kinds of pharmacological agents. These all have different kinds of mechanisms of action. Um, and yet the rate in, of the percentage of patients who remain resistant to pharmacology has been stubbornly fixed at around 30%. It's quite a remarkable graph. It's not to say that these agents are better. You know, we're not stuck in 1950 in terms of our pharmacological treatment of epilepsy. The side effects are much less, for example. Um, if pregnant women can take uh, anti-epileptics without causing there to be um, problems with the development of the fetus. Um, but yet it still looks like there's about 30% of patients whose seizures, seizures cannot be treated with the available um, drugs that are on the market. So what can be done? And one of the oldest um, treatment options is removing a part of the brain. And um, this uh, technique was really pioneered by William Penfield uh, at McGill. And um, not all people who have pharmacoresistant seizures are eligible to have a part of their brain removed. You have to know which part of the brain they should be removed. So if a seizure presents with a focal onset, so that means it doesn't begin everywhere all at once, but you can have an aura, you can have a sense that it's beginning in a particular part of the brain, and that's your first hint. The other hint will come from some kind of medical imaging. In the olden days, what they would do is replace your cerebral spinal fluid with air and take an x-ray, and then you could look for abnormalities this way. Of course, now we have much more sophisticated kind of medical imaging to see where there's potential damage in the brain. And then finally, you can't just remove any part of the brain. Some parts of the brain are just essential for our you know, ability to speak, our ability to recognize objects. And so these parts of the cortex are called eloquent cortex. And so how can we find whether or not a particular part of the cortex is essential for your existence? And um, the way this was pioneered is through microstimulation. And so they actually open up uh, the skull and they do microstimulation to see if you lose that faculty. And if you lose that faculty and that part of the brain looks like it's a seizure focus, then you cannot have that part of the brain removed. That's, that's called eloquent cortex and you need to have yet another kind of treatment option. And another tr treatment option is called responsive neural stimulation. And so in this case, an electrode could be implanted within the seizure onset zone. And then uh, there's a computer chip that's implanted in your skull. And all of the time uh, it's detecting, is a seizure happening? And once a seizure is detected, then electrical current is delivered to the seizure onset zone with the hope that that will stop the seizure from happening. And this is an extremely valuable technology. There's thousands of people who have um, this kind of implant, this kind of uh, brain stimulation um, implanted, um, but it has limitations. One of the limitations is even within this, um, there's a quarter of these patients for which this is not effective. Uh, another limitation is it's only available for focal epilepsy with a known locus. There could be pe people who have multiple different loci. And as I mentioned, there could be cases where you have no idea where the seizure is beginning because it looks like it's beginning everywhere at once. Um, the company that produces RNS, Responsive Neural Stimulation, is working on addressing this by trying to find other kinds of targets for those kinds of uh, situation. But as it is right now, this is only indicated for patients where you have a known locus. And its mechanism of action is actually not terribly well understood. You know, I painted kind of um, a very black and white picture where the seizure start, starts, electrical stimulation is delivered and the seizure ends. But actually, if you look at the long-term efficacy of this kind of therapeutic, it doesn't correlate with the ability of the electrical stimulation to stop the seizure. So somehow there's some kind of neuromodulation, some kind of neuroplasticity that's involved with the repetitive stimulation of the seizure onset zone, which itself is therapeutic, unknown, totally unknown how that works. And because we don't have a very good mechanistic model, how do we stimulate? You know, the stimulation space is huge. You know, what, what is the frequency we stimulate? How big are the pulses? How large should the pulses be? You know, exactly where in the brain should we stimulate? When, you know, when I, me and Dr. Parrish do our kind of uh, stimulation experiments in neural tissue, we don't fix it according to our amplifier. We have a desired biological effect and every experiment is a little bit different. How good is our electrode? Where do we place the electrode? How much of our viruses is being expressed? And we try to normalize across all of our experiments the desired evoked response. Here, we don't know what is a therapeutic desire to evoke response. There's no good biomarker for what effective stimulation should look like. And so the company that makes this device has a manual. Start off at this frequency with these amplitudes. You know, what we really miss is, you know, what should a therapeutic stimulation look like from the brain's point of view? And finally, you know, the seizure started. You know, the seizure's already disrupted the normal cognitive processes that are happening in the brain. It might not have generalized, but the part of the brain in which the seizure has started is already not functioning as it should. And so these are the goals of my, my research. You know, can we find regions that we can stimulate that are going to be effective when there's multiple different foci or when the foci is unknown? And can we move beyond reacting to seizures that have started? Can we predict the initiation of the seizure and stimulate before the seizure has begun? And I should say that there's um, deep brain stimulation that's on the market, which is on constantly. So electrodes are implanted in the thalamus and they're left on at 130 Hertz. And th this was the, the first kind of deep brain stimulation for epilepsy. And this is, a self is, is effective. 
Um, but the stimulation is on all the time and seizures don't happen all of the time. And so it'd be nice to limit the amount of disruption that you do to the brain through your therapeutic, through this kind of targeted stimulation. And so we come back to Dr. Penfield. And I think like most neuroscientists, we're interested in the brain because we're interested in the mind. And we're interested in the mind because, you know, how is it that we have, seems like we have the will to make volitional movements? Why is it that we're conscious? And the study of the epilepsy maybe promises some answers to those very deep questions because you lose control of your body and you lose consciousness, consciousness and it comes back again. And Dr. Penfield, you know, wrote explicitly that this was his interest in the treatment of epilepsy to try to answer some of these deep philosophical questions. And so he came up with this idea of the centrocephalic integrating system. This is a term that's not really used in contemporary neuroscience, um, but the idea that um, the higher brainstem is interacting with the rest of the cerebral cortex to give you somehow volition. Through those interactions, voluntary movements can come out and consciousness can come out. And if you have dysregulation somewhere in this circuit, then you lose awareness and you lose the ability to have willful control over your body. So as I say, I mean, this was a, um, Dr. Penfield was a giant in this field, but this concept here, the centrocephalic integrating system hasn't really uh, stood the test of time, but the important role of the higher brainstem has. And so this is a part of the brain that I study. Um, and so I study the two parts of the brain that are called the lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus, the peduncular pontine nucleus. And these two parts of the brain contain cholinergic neurons. And uh, they're part of what's called the ascending reticular activating system. And so what you're looking at here, this is a sagittal slice of the brain and the neurons that produce acetylcholine uh, have used immunohistochemistry to stain them red. And so you can see where they are. And these are extremely, as the, the whole um, ascending reticular activating system is extremely important for regulating your consciousness and for sleep-wake cycles. And we can use the powers of optogenetics. And if you're not familiar, optogenetics is a technology where you can deliver a foreign protein that you can use light to activate the neurons. And you know, similar how in your eye, you're converting light energy into electrochemical energy. There's these kind of proteins that are doing the same kind of energy transfer across the animal kingdom, the bacterial kingdom, plant kingdom. And um, we can take the DNA codes for those proteins, put them in a virus, pump the virus in the brain, and now get light access for the millisecond time scale to control of those neurons. And so in this experiment, what was done is they stimulated these neurons in the cholinergic midbrain, the lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus and the peduncular pontine nucleus. And if you stimulate for 80 seconds, you can see there's an increase in the transition into REM sleep from slow wave sleep. And so why is this interesting in the context of epilepsy? Well, if you look at when do these generalized seizures tend to occur? And these generalized seizures, this is what kills people with epilepsy. If the seizure invades the brainstem, then you can stop breathing and you, and you die. And so being able to stop the generalizing seizures is extremely important. And these are very rare during REM sleep. And so we know now what are some of the neurobiology of what is controlling the transitions from slow wave sleep into REM sleep. Is this a therapeutic target? And so what is it about REM that makes it neuroprotective? So um, this is just EEG from the person. And you can see that when they wake, you get this kind of low amplitude of regular activity. And as you fall deeper and deeper to sleep, you get these slow waves here. This is the delta wave. And then when you snap into REM, it kind of looks like you're awake. The brain goes from having these slow oscillations back into this low amplitude of regular activity. Rodents have this too. This is data from the lab. And here, this is an example of slow wave sleep. And you can see that there's these different bouts. Here, everything's kind of, so every, what you're looking at is, um, this is time, this is voltage. Every um, line here is from a different electrode and they're grouped. So what we have planned something that looks like a fork. This is one time of the fork. This is another time of the fork organized from the top to the bottom of the brain. And you can see that these periods here with everything's kind of crazy, this high frequency activity, and then it's flat. High frequency activity and it's flat. High frequency activity is flat. And what's happening is if you were recording the membrane potential of a single neuron in the cortex, you would see it is bimodal. That every neuron is existing, in an excited state and then a less excited state. And it's snapping back and forth between the two. And these are called up and down states. And so if we look at a model of that, you see here what's shown every dot, this is called a raster. Every, every dot is an action potential from a neuron. It's a simulated neuron, but if I, you know, just because I couldn't find as beautiful a graph of the real data, but the real data does look like this too. And you can see that these neurons are firing and then they stop. And really almost all of the neurons are silenced during these down states. And this is what's making the delta wave coordinated activity between neurons being fired in their up states and their down states. And they're not being inhibited during the down states. Truly, it's that there's no neurons that are active. Yes? What's the time scale on that? Um, it's a model, but typically the delta wave is about uh, one to four hertz. Um, it's not a true oscillation. So um, what is observed is that the up states have more variable durations than the down states. And you know, that property of the variability of those durations can give you some hints as to the underlying mechanism. Um, 
yeah, good question. Every graph should have a time scale. <laughs> so um, this is what uh, you know what's going on in the cortex during slow wave sleep, and here's what's going on during REM. You lose the downstates, and the neurons are existing in this asynchronous regime all of the time. So what is it about stimulating the cholinergic midbrain that is uh, causing a shift from having the downstates to not? So this is the recording from the cortex and the cat. And you can see here, this is the intracellular recording from a, a cortical neuron. And you can see it exists in the upstate, fire lots of action potentials, downstate, upstate, downstate. Then you stimulate the pedo pedocular pontine nucleus. This is the cholinergic midbrain area. And now you get this nice tonic firing here. All right, but one funny thing, the pedocular pontine nucleus doesn't actually project to the cortex. So how is it able, the acetylcholine even able to get up there to cause this kind of effects? And there's this through the thalamus. So as I mentioned, you know, thalamic stimulation is one of the earliest targets for deep brain stimulation in the epilepsy. And you know, maybe for this reason, maybe one of the things that this tonic stimulation of the thalamus does is induce this kind of tonic firing. So in this case, again, this is in the cat. They stimulate the pedunculo pontine nucleus. And now this graph has a time scale. Holy moly, you know, look at this sustained multi-second long depolarization of that thalamic neuron with the tonic firing patterns. And so it's like, this is the wake-up call. Get out of your slow-wave sleep pattern and start the asynchronous pattern in the, in, in the cortex. And then here's in my, my own data. And so what you're looking at, um, this is um, data from the thalamus. And on the y-axis here, this is the interspike interval. That's the amount of time that occurs between two action potentials. Zero here is a transition from slow-wave sleep into REM. You never go from waking to REM, even in the rodent. And you can see that during slow-wave sleep, you get kind of a bimodal pattern. That when you see orange here, that means most of the observations happen at this interspike interval. So some of the interspike intervals, the log scale are short. These are the bursts. And some of them are long. This is the time in between the two upstates. And so this neuron is going silent, silent. And then all of a sudden, very rapidly in this transition to REM, you can see that it's existing in this tonic firing mode throughout the duration of REM. Where is that coming from? Maybe the cholinergic modulation coming from the mid -range. That's the hypothesis. So is this therapeutic? Uh, is tonic firing therapeutic? There's been one experiment that I think really nicely gets at that. And so here they use a kind of opsin called a switch opsin. So what you're looking at here, this is the firing rate over time. Um, and with this kind of opsin, you shine blue light and it turns it on. And you can see that this neuron fires lots of action potentials. These are trials. These tick marks are action potentials. And then with yellow light, you turn it off again. And so it's pretty amazing technology that you can make the brain dance like that with two different wavelengths of light. And so the idea is that this is kind of a tonic firing mode. This should be the therapeutic firing mode in, in the thalamus. And so what these people did is they detected the seizure in real time. They turned on the switch opsin in the thalamus and it looked like the seizure stopped. And of course, you know, every good experiment has a control. In this case, they have a kind of similar virus, but it doesn't have the opsin inside. And so in this case, it looks like, you know, you could still turn on the light, but the seizure will continue. So maybe these tonic firing um, is important, but we're missing connecting all of the dots here. Yes. Sorry, so they're stimulating the port that- No, thalamus. Thalamus here. And yeah. the blue light is on just for a very short time. It's a switch opsin. You only need to have a little tiny pulse of blue, and then that'll stay depolarized until you turn it off with the yellow. Yeah. So yeah, there's a, um, we're living in a golden age of neuroscience right now, where there's all of these different kinds of tools for having a very tight spatiotemporal control of neural activity. Different wavelengths of light can depolarize or hyperpolarize, activate or silence neurons. Um, and you can have either ones that have very fast activity or very slow activity. Um, so yeah, this is a, these are real tools. You could just buy them from catalog and pump them in the brain and they, they work like advertised. <laughs> it wasn't like that 10 years ago. All right, so I think um, you know, it was a long preamble but I think this it gives you a preparation for what are the guiding hypotheses for a research program. You know, we think that REM is a protective state because of this asynchronous cortical activity. We think that cortical asynchrony is being driven by tonic firing in the thalamus. We think that this tonic firing is being driven by co cholinergic uh, modulation coming from the midbrain, the pedunculo pontine nucleus and the lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus. Uh, and we think that uh, the stimulation of these brain regions and controlling um, REM sleep is therapeutic because it's a less perturbable brain state. And I didn't show you data to that final point, but um, there is data for this final point. All right, so here's the, the hypothesis. Does stimulating these REM promoting brain regions prevent seizure initiation? So here's our prep. Um, we work with rats. And um, in these rats, we can make a coronal temporal lobe epilepsy model by injecting an um, panic acid which is, uh, induces excitotoxicity in the hippocampus. You inject it, the animal is in status, meaning they have seizures after seizures after seizures, which spontaneously resolve. And then there's an incubation period where it doesn't look like anything nasty is happening in the brain. And it's unknown how long this incubation period is, but we wait forever. And then we implant them with electrodes. And what we see is that 
even without being provoked, seizures spontaneously emerge. And so this is a nice model of chronic temporal lobe epilepsy in the rodent where we can begin to test different kinds of stimulation protocols. And so typically what we do, we make the animal sick, we wait, we implant, we let them recover, and then we can play around with this kind of um, stimulation day where we have a record baseline, then we can stimulate or not, and then we can see what happens afterwards, does the brain recover? And um, these are the kind of seizures that we see. Um, and as you see, you know, I called it a you know, Swiss cheese model. We're implanting electrodes throughout the limbic system. So in the hippocampus, in the amygdala, in the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, we've got skull screws bilaterally in the cortex, and then we've got a stimulation electrode in the lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus. These are kind of um, seizures that we see. Um, and so in this case, we actually damaged the left CA1, but we've got a seizure here that initiates on the right CA1. CA1 is a subregion of the hippocampus. And this seizure nicely starts and then generalizes to the rest of the brain here. In our animals, we do not see a very high density of these seizures, and that's normal. And it's actually a feature, not a bug, because people who have epilepsy are not having constant seizures either. But it has become a challenge for us as a, as a running a re relatively new lab to have the statistical power to look at seizures per se. People who have epilepsy, the seizures are only one kind of abnormal electrical activity that occurs in the brain. There's other kinds of abnormal epileptiform activity, and we see that also in the rodent. And so that's what I'm going to be showing to you and quantifying for you. Though right now, as I speak back in Albuquerque, they're running more experiments where there's longer periods of monitoring stimulation. So hopefully my dependent measure can be seizures next time I come to Brigham Young University. So what are these other kinds of funny brain activities we see? And they're called the interepileptiform discharges, or IEDs. And so these um, are maladaptive in their own right. If you have a working memory task, and I ask you to you know, look at this remote here, put it in my pocket, and then ask you, you know, what did you see five seconds ago? If you had an ID in between, you're that kind of working memory is decreased. So these do interrupt the kind of normal cognitive functions of the brain. And we see them. We see them in our animal model. And so here we see them in all the brain regions that we look at. And in this case, the way to read this plot is here, we detect the interepileptiform discharge um, in the motor cortex on the left hemisphere. And this is what the voltage response looks like for all of the other different kinds, uh, all the other electric placements. So you can see that they're relatively synchronized events, but not perfectly synchronized events. They're locally generated. And so here's um, just a table showing how the brain synchronizes with itself. So the reference, this is we, where we are detecting the event for all of these different regions. And then what I ask is in every other part of the brain, do I see two different IEDs that are occurring within 25 milliseconds of one another? This is what I'm calling at the same time. That's a little bit arbitrary. Um, but the results don't really seem to matter if I make that window bigger. And so this um, seems to honor that some of the known anatomy. So let's take a look. So if I detect the IDs in the thalamus, you can see this is strongly synchronizing with the cortex. That's the model. The thalamus is meant to be the hub that's allowing the generalization of the seizures to occur from one part of the cortex to another. If um, we look over here, that even though these are um, on the left and right sides, the two different parts of the um, brain that have homologous function are strongly correlated with one another. That honors the known anatomy too. The thalamus is also tightly correlated with the hippocampus, and the hippocampus is tightly correlated with the thalamus. And then finally, if we look at the lateral dorsal tegment, uh, so the lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus, this is strongly correlated with the thalamus. As I said, this is uh, you know, honoring the known anatomy here. So we have a network of these abnormal epileptiform activities that we can record everywhere in the brain. So in a way, this is also a nice model because we know that they're locally generated events. We know that they can synchronize. Does our stimulation decrease them everywhere? So here, this is just showing um, record data recorded from each of our different sites. Here's a couple of these interapileptiform discharges that I flag. And here is a long bout of theta. So theta is the clock, which is synchronizing the entire limbic system in the rodent. It's an eight hertz oscillation. If the animals are running, you will see the whole limbic system clocking along at eight hertz. If you look at different parts of the limbic system, there could be phase offsets. So if there's a peak one area, it could be a trough in the other, but the whole brain is going at the same frequency. That doesn't only happen when the animals are moving. This is also our electrophysiological signature of REM sleep. So if I'm looking at the hippocampus and I see a nice bout of theta like this, and I see the animals not moving, I could tell you with absolute certainty that the animals in, in REM sleep, it's like that every time. And so what if I see is if I look at the rate, the IED rate as a function of how much theta power I see, you see that there's this anti strong anti-correlated relationship. These are antagonistic brain states here. We look at the ratio of theta to delta for technical reason. Um, if you take the, um, the Fourier spectrum of neural activity, what you see, there's always more power in the lower frequency bands. And that's because to get a lower frequency activity, more of the brain needs to be involved. And many physical systems have this relationship where you get more power at lower frequencies and less and less power at higher frequencies. And so one way to just normalize for that effect is to take this ratio between theta and delta. 
All right, so let's get to some of the data here. This is um, data from a single session. And so what's shown in blue, this is the amount of theta that's present. And what's in, I'm colorblind, red, uh, this is the, the ID rate. So how often do I see these kind of abnormal epileptiform patterns? And I hope you can appreciate just on a moment to moment basis that whenever you see strong theta, you see a very strong decrease in the ID rate. Now we begin to stimulate the lateral dose of tegmental nucleus for an hour. And you can see that during this period, the ID rate drops and theta, you can see both the baseline power increases, but also the rates of these bouts. So this is one session. And this is for the whole cohort. So in this case, we had eight animals. Each of the animals had multiple different sessions. We were playing around. We didn't know what was the right inter stimulus interval to give our stimulation. So we played around with this. Actually, the longest ones were not effective, but they're included in the average here. As I say, we're just starting the lab and figuring out what's the, the magic bullet here for um, treating these animals. And so you can see that now we're normalizing by baseline because different animals have different rates of their inter from discharges. Whenever you see a graph that has delta, that means that the um, uh, intersubject variability is higher than the intrasubject variability, which is true in our case as well. Um, that you see that the stimulation causes a strong increase in the theta, as is consistent with REM, and a strong decrease, about a 30% decrease, in the IED rate. And this will immediately recover back to baseline as soon as we turn our stimulation back off again. So this was encouraging for us. Um, another way to look at the same data is um, against sham stimulation protocols. So in this case, everything was the same about how we treated these animals, except for we just didn't turn on the stimulation. This is actually extremely important because when we plug in our animals, that's a stressful event. You know, the animals, we are opening the box, we're holding their head, we're shoving a plug inside of the, uh, that's implanted on their skull, we're changing the amount of light that's coming in. So it's really important to kind of do everything the same except for not have the stimulation. So in this case, we can look, when we stimulate, we get a decrease in the same session for baseline, which re re returns immediately afterwards. And this is significantly different than our control sessions where basically everything was the same, even the same subjects, um, but we just didn't turn on our, our current in this case. All right. So, you know, I told you that I'm looking for this part of the brain that's not just effective in treating the focus, but could be effective in treating seizures irrespective of their locus. And so, as I say, IVs are not seizures, but we can record them everywhere. And we're causing a true brain state change. We see no matter where we look, that when we turn on the IVs, a decrease from the baseline in terms of the IV rate. So this was extremely promising for us that perhaps these cholinergic midbrain areas could be one such target that um, would be appropriate for patients who have multiple foci or in cases where the foci is unknown, or perhaps even in generalized epilepsy, where the seizure begins everywhere all at once. So we thought, you know, there's always variability in experiment, that the amount in, uh, to which we can induce theta would be strongly correlated with the uh, degree to which we could decrease the rate of inter epileptiform discharges. And this was not the case. So every dot here is a session that we ran and is color coded by the subject of the animal. And you can see that very reliably we're increasing theta. This is just a histogram of these dots. Um, so very reliably we're increasing theta, very reliably we're decreasing their ID rate, but there's no way that you could look at this plot and draw a line here. So it doesn't seem like that this is the whole story. And indeed, we could look a little bit more closely. So here's looking at the baseline and the stimulation sessions. This is the amount of theta that we see that you're spending during stimulation much more time in the high theta state. But even in the low theta state, we're getting a decrease in the IV rate. So there's some magic here that comes from stimulating these cholinergic midbrain regions that we don't understand yet. All right, so I'm um, coming back to our broad research goals. You know, is there a region that we could stimulate to mitigate seizure spread? And I said, yes, perhaps it's the cholinergic midbrain. Um, we have more work to do. There's some very attractive features of this part of the brain, though, because as I showed you, you could stimulate and get this very long lasting effect of the cholinergic modulation of the soundness over seconds. So perhaps you don't need to be constantly stimulating to have this prolonged therapeutic effect. All right, the next part of my research talk, and actually perhaps I stop here for questions before we dive into part two. So, do we, yeah. Um, so I was curious, you said you used the same subjects multiple times. Are yes. you seeing any changes after subsequent trials? The experiments were not designed to answer that question. And when we do try to look at it anyway, no. <laughs> um, but yes, that's a dream, right? Like I told you that the RNS stimulation seems to get better over time. You know, now that we know what's the right stimulation, what we could do is we could leave the animal plugged in constantly and see if you know, constitutively, the rate of seizures at the interapilaptiform discharges decreases over time. That'd be a dream outcome. Other questions? Yes. Yes, yeah, so you're activating the cholinergic system. Yes. Right, to try to, to treat uric acid and reduce temporal seizures, but you think that it might be correlatable to other types of seizures in the world? Yeah, we can think of this could apply across. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have a data for that. 
Um, but I, I don't see why not, because, you know, as I showed you, these generalized seizures are very rare during REM sleep. And we know that the LDT stimulation causes REM sleep, not only in people, but in cats and monkeys, uh, not only in mice, but in, in um, cats and monkeys and in people. Uh, it holds across uh, in the cat kind of seizures that are induced by penicillin in the cat. <laughs> and um, this hasn't been, you know, I'm showing you, I only know in this one animal model so far. But in terms of um, the anti-correlation between generalized seizures and REM, this holds across multiple different types of epilepsy in people. That's as good as I can I can do. Could you use uh, neurostimulation to look at how it changes to see how the REM changes in the rodents? Um, has, has that changed due to neurostimulation? Yeah, so you probably noticed that I was careful not to call it REM. You know, I'm saying I'm inducing theta, and the theta is an unambiguous biomarker of natural REM. But I didn't say that I'm inducing REM. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, first, to be rigorous about it, you need to record EMG. So during REM, you have atonia, and it's actually the atonia is being induced by the same parts of the brain. The pedunculate ponti nucleus has ascending fibers, which are cholinergic, and descending fibers, which are GABAergic, they're inhibitory. And that's what's inducing the REM atonia. And actually, that's why this part of the brain was targeted for the treatment of Parkinson's disease, because they thought maybe that could treat some of the um, positive motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. It didn't, but it actually improved cognitive outcomes by re better regulating sleep. So by and sleep is um, also dysregulated in Parkinson's disease. Um, so am I inducing REM? I don't know. I, if I was recording EMG and I saw that the EMG was, if I could induce a totally flat uh, EMG and I could do strong theta and I was inducing strong cortical asynchrony that I would still say I'm inducing a REM-like state because a lot of things are changing um, the different sleep cycles and um, I think it's just a little bit more rigorous to call it REM-like but I'm not even calling it REM-like I'm saying that I'm inducing a REM biomarker which is theta in, in the rodent. Yes other questions yeah. Um, what do you mean those side effects in behavior? We don't know. Um, and so, you know, if it looks like this, these results replicate and replicate on seizures, then of course the question is, um, is it bad to be in REM all the time? Right? You know, there's a reason why we have alternating cycles in our sleep. During slow wave sleep, there's a very important event that occurs called the sharp wave ripple. And um, this is a, a very synchronous moment in the hippocampus, and it's a high frequency oscillation. And uh, if you record the electrical activity of single neurons in the hippocampus, which you see is something called a place cell, which is a group of neurons that'll fire when you're in a particular location. And if you walk, different subsets of neurons are gonna be active in sequence. When you stop, you get these sharp waves. And the neurons that were active reactivate, but 10 to 15 times faster. These happen during ripples. The ripple events are correlated with these up and down state transitions. They're correlated with something called a spindle, which is a, a thalamocortical event. And the synchronization of the spindles and the ripples is extremely important for memory. If you disrupt the ripple, and if you disrupt the synchronization between the hippocampus and the cortex during the ripple, you get memory deficits. You never see ripples during high acetylcholine states. You never see ripples during REM. And so, you know, if you're turning off these ripple events, it could be very bad for memory consolidation. However, if you're having constant epileptiform activity, it could be bad too. And so the question is, which is worse? You know, this is the, the treatment of the disease. And so, you know, if it looks like that we can replicate these findings with seizures, then the next thing we'll do is a, a cognitive battery of memory performance to see if we can actually recover some of the known deficits in memory consolidation that happens uh, with, with these epilepsy models. All right, thank you, everybody. All right, so the next part um, is, you know, can we move beyond reacting to seizures? You know, as I mentioned, the seizures have begun to disrupt the normal cognitive process. Um, so wouldn't it be nice if we could predict when the seizure was going to happen? If you ask patients what happens before the seizure, there's some awareness of this, which has been known for some time. And one of the biggest predictors that people report is stress. Um, and you can see that a lot of these have to do with stress, medication compliance, alcohol is a big one. Probably the most famous um, and the, is flashing lights. This is a reflex ep ep epilepsy which are caused by flashing lights, actually relatively rare. Um, it's not the whole story. Most seizures don't happen for a reason that the patient can understand. And most seizures are happening actually upon a background of fluctuating vulnerability. Sorry, Sam. Do we know what, like during these high stress states, what that does to our brain oscillations? Has anyone kind of studied that? You know, like these kind of... Yeah, like why is cortisol excited to, you know, end up giving you a more excitable tissue? I don't know the answer to that, but if not to say that nobody knows the answer to that. <laughs> Um, so 
you know, one of the strongest predictors of a seizure is the time of day. So it's not that everybody's getting the seizures in the morning or midnight, um, but if you look to see, just line up everybody in the study and say, when are the seizures happening? And call that your up phase. And you can see that it's all different times of the day. The, the length of this arrow here is telling you how reliable that effect is. And so really, if you do statistical analysis with your odds ratio, the circadian effect far and away outweighs anything else that we can understand. So this, as I mentioned, is you know, corresponding to the phases of sleep. That there's different cycles um, in, of sleep, which tend to be more vulnerable. Um, but that's riding on top of a much slower rhythm. And so I opened up you know, with the story from the Bible and the description of the lunatic. You know, People under, thought that the seizure vulnerability came and went with a full moon. That's not the case. But there are multidian cycles in seizure. And they can take, you know, the average period looks like it's a month, even for non-menstruating women, even for men. Very interesting. And it's totally unknown where these cycles and vulnerability come from. And so in this study, what was done is you see coming from patients who were chronically implanted with electrodes for the, uh, for the um, responsive neural stimulation. And what you can see is that um, the patients will have the interapileptiform discharges that come and go in waves. And the seizures tend to happen on the ups upswing of those waves. And we know that the brain is fluctuating and its excitability because we can do something called transcranial magnetic stimulation. So you can stimulate the brain with strong magnets. And before the seizure, the brain is more excitable. So there are little hints of things that are ch changing in the brain reliably before the seizure occurs. All right, so can we detect them? You know, can we detect these changes that are happening even before the seizure begins to try to intercept and change the brain before it goes down the, to the dark side and, and you end up getting a seizure? And so this is the whole field of a seizure forecasting field. And um, this is my approach to the problem. Typically what's done is you take the seizure and you take the time, um, and the seizure is called an ictal event. And so then you take the pre-ictal event, which is the time before the seizure. And you say, can I differentiate that from a time point that's further away? But you know, how long should that time point be before the seizure? Should it be an hour? Should it be 10 minutes? Should it be a day? And I showed you, you know, all of these fluctuations here. There isn't just one time scale with which you're going to describe you know, what's the vulnerable period before the seizure occurs. And so I play a different kind of matching game where I know when the seizures occur. And I can say, all right, what was the brain doing in a window 10 seconds before? What was the brain doing in a block 10 minutes before? What about 10 minutes to an hour? And what about more than an hour away? And can we match up the state of the brain to each of these different categories? And actually, I have another category here, which I should put is what's happening after the seizure. This is also a very important brain state, the post ictal brain state. So I've got six different categories. And I'm trying to break based off of the pattern of the brain, which of the six categories are you in? And so there's a lot of different ways to say what is happening at the brain at any given time. You know, the most naive approach would just be put your electrode in, you're getting voltage measure, whatever the pattern of voltage is across your electrodes at that given moment is the state of the brain. That's not the right answer. Your, your algorithms don't work like that. So um, a, if you look in the literature, there's like a hundred different kinds of computations that people do to quantify what is happening at the brain in any given moment. Since we don't know the language the brain uses to communicate with itself, there's no one right algorithm. So what I've picked is just a spectral approach. You know, which brain rhythms are present? How do those brain rhythms coordinate with each other and with themselves? So what is a, a rule in the brain is that the high frequency activity tends to be nested at the phase of the low frequency activity. So look at the phase amplitude coupling and the coherence and the wavelet power across all different kinds of frequency bands. So what I have in my animal is that every moment, every one second, I've got 600 numbers describing the state of the brain. And I'm gonna say, based off of those 600 numbers, where do I think I am in terms of how far away the seizure is going to be? It's hard to imagine a 600 dimensional space. So there's different kinds of dimensionality reduction techniques to get a handle of what that data looks like. And one of them is called TSNE. And so what I'm showing you here is a two dimensional probability density plot. And so let's just focus right now on this 10 second window here. These axes don't mean anything. It's a, a, a nonlinear embedding of my 600 dimensional space, but the colors mean something. So it's this, these islands here, it's, it's telling me that most of the time when you're 10 seconds before the seizure, the brain is in one of these kinds of states. And I've circled the islands so that you can pay attention to that as you go back in your feature space. And what you observe is if you're very far away from the seizure, these regions are less occupied. They're blue instead of yellow. So this to me was my first, all right, this is gonna be a solvable problem because at least my probability density functions don't overlap. If it looked the same at each one of these different time windows, it would be impossible to solve the issue. However, it's also giving me some hints as to you know, how my classification algorithm will fail. So if you pay attention to this island up here, you can see that there's actually quite a lot of times when you're an hour away from the seizure, but it looks like you're in this immediately pre state. That means you're gonna get a lot of false positives. And the field is plagued with false positives. And unfortunately, you spend much more of your time here than you do here. 
So your, your false positives are going to far outweigh you know, your true positives in this case, which means that you also need to be clever about how you train your algorithm. Seizures are rare. You know, if I just want to get the best possible performance, just say you're never going to have a seizure, right? And you do pretty well, but that's not good enough. You want to put your finger on the scale and count certain kinds of errors to be more meaningful than other kinds of errors. And so I highly recommend that if you are doing this kind of machine learning games, to plot your data like this, to give you a feel. You know, I also, you know, I can't draw a line anywhere and say on one side of the line, it's good and one side of the line is bad. So it's a highly nonlinear problem too, which is also telling me the kinds of classification algorithms that I should um, bring to bear for the problem. So the kind of classification, um, this is sometimes called the best out of the box classification problem. It's this random forest algorithm. So the idea is that I've got all of my 600 different features that I'm using to describe the state of the brain and I ask for feature one, is it above or below some value? Feature two, blah, 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 and so-and-so. And then, so this is, um, uh, this is called a tree. And then at the end, you've got leaves. And then these leaves are the binary classifications for which state you think you're in. Every one of these trees is a very weak classifier. But if you bring many of them together, you uh, have a, what's called a random forest. You have a very, very strong classifier. And it's able to arbitrarily slice and dice your feature space just according to what is the decision variable that's at each one of these nodes here. And so there's a variant of this random forest classifier that um, puts its finger on the scale to undersample the common case so that you can have a balance between the cases of your rare event and your common event, which in this case was necessary. And so that's called the Rust Boost algorithm for the aficionados who might be interested in trying something at home. All right, so how did it work? So what you're looking at here, um, this is 24 hours of data, continuous data. And first, you know, we better be able to actually detect the seizure. Right? If we can't detect the seizure, there's no hope in predicting. And it's not trivial to predict to actually just detect these events from EEG. That's an ongoing machine learning challenge, actually, to detect seizures from scalp EEG. What you're looking at the y-axis from 0 to 1, this is um, my model saying, what's the probability that the brain state in every second is giving me a seizure? The dashed lines are the seizures. So just looking at here, you can see that this is high, this is high. You know, It's catching the ball, so we don't have any false negatives. And you get all this kind of weird stuff. If you look at what's happening in the brain here, it's not normal. And so it's detecting kind of abnormal epileptic form activity, but it's not actually meeting the true standard for a seizure um, by my standards, nor even by the model standards. It's not as high. As I mentioned, there's another class here, the post dictal that after you can see this is a very long event. It takes a long time for the brain to recover back to baseline. I trained my model to say post dictal is 10 minutes. I made up a number. And you know, I figured 10 minutes, you should be back to normal by then. You're not. You know, my model can, is telling you that um, you know, it's taking you even up to a half an hour to an hour to recover to baseline. And I've made other versions of this model where now I'm trying to predict not only how far you to the next seizure, but how far you from the last seizure to tell you where in that phase you are. And you can do this too, which is, has important implications for the detection of um, status, which is seizures that keep coming and coming and coming. That's what kills you. All right, so what about for the full model? So here's all of the different classes of where my model thinks you are. The y-axis is the probability. And just pay attention to this first seizure here. You can see here, my model thinks you're one to three hours away. It's got a it's high when you're far away, and then it creates this little window. It dips, and you can see that this probability mask gets closer and closer to the seizure as you would expect. So this is a case of the model behaving behaving well. But look at my preictal detector. There's all of these times giving me false positives. That was I you could have predicted that from just looking at the probability density function. The whole field is um, plagued by this problem, and maybe it's not a problem. Maybe there is not actually a true unique brain state that's saying you're about to have a seizure. Maybe the seizure is a probabilistic event, that when the brain is in a vulnerable brain state, you flip a coin. Are you going to tip or not? And so maybe these should be treated as well. So there's different ways to quantify how good these machine learning algorithms are doing. This is all the same data, just looked at with different lenses. So here's the real time to the seizure. And this is the output from my model. My model thinks you're an hour away. That starts high and goes down. When my model thinks you're kind of intermediate, that starts low and increases. When my model thinks you're preictal, you know, I don't miss, but I've got lots of false positives. This is called a confusion matrix. The way to read this, this is really what class you're in. This is what my model thinks. A perfect classifier is just going to be hot along the diagonal. Every time that you are really having a seizure, model thinks you're having a seizure and nowhere else. Every time you're really three hours away from uh, the seizure, the model predictably says this and nowhere else. And you can see that these classes I do pretty well. And then there's some ambiguity here. There's probably not a unique brain pattern fingerprint that's describing you know, when you're within an hour to the seizure. As again, you know, this is um, quite a mature field of seizure forecasting. There's a lot of ways to quantify how these models are doing. And so you want to know, is it you're doing better than chance? Well, what's chance? And so in my case, my chance is just if I randomly shuffle my data in time, and I'm going to have a mismatch between whether or not um, my uh, algorithm that I is, the data is taken from 10 seconds for the seizure, I can randomly now assign that to any one of my bins. And I can ask how much better than chance am I doing? 
with my models saying um, more than an hour away, you can see I'm doing about 50% better than chance when you are really an hour away. And I never get confused, you know, if, if you have a seizure, the after the seizure. Likewise, if you're 10 minutes to an hour away, you can see you do best at this time point, but the errors systematically generalize over time. The brain is kind of easing into this vulnerable brain state. Likewise, here for 10 seconds, you can see the scale bar is changing. I'm doing much, much better than chance at detecting this immediately predictable state. 10 seconds is a lifetime for computers. You know, that's plenty of time to be able to react and stimulate. Um, there's many ways to quantify this. Another kind of way to quantify, I'm not doing binary classification, but you can do something called an ROC analysis for binary classification, where you're looking at the area under the curve. Um, I think I'll, just for the interest of time, I won't explain what an ROC plot is. Um, all right, so is my forecaster working for boring reasons? Right, and what are these boring reasons? I mean, when does a seizure begin? That's a, you know, not actually um, an obvious question. I showed you that the biggest predictor of when a seizure will happen is sleep-wake. Well, it should be pretty easy for me to detect using the brain activity animals awake or asleep. Am I just building a state detector? And all of the rest of the gains are from there. And so this data uh, was taken, uh, the data that I'm showing you here was taken actually from, um, not from me, I should have said that at the beginning, from a collaborator, Helen Scharfman, and she's got a big database of spontaneous seizures. And in her animal model, which is also the kinetic acid model, um, they show circadian effects. So depending on the phase of the disease, uh, soon after or long after the kind of acid, you could have more seizures during waking or sleeping. But suffice it to say that just like in the person, there's circadian effects, or at least sleep-wake effects. Um, and so, you know, I hopefully was not just building a sleep-wake detector. Likewise, there's actually different ways that seizures can begin. Some seizures begin with something called a sentinel spike. So this is voltage, voltage over time and, and four different electrodes. So you hear the seizures beginning with a big bang, all synchronized at once as a moment of science and blah, everything just begins having a seizure. Other seizures begin with these inter diaphragm discharges get faster and faster and faster and then the seizure emerges. Well, where does this seizure begin? You know, that becomes um, a little bit uh, like splitting hairs. And so it's possible that my seizure detector, you know, was just working when I was doing a crummy job at the tell telling you when the seizure started. So what do we do? We split up the seizures and we say, how good are you at predicting these events as a function of this, the sleep-wake state of the animal and as a function of how they begin. And long story short, for all of these six different classes of seizures, I can predict much better than chance. For certain kinds of seizures, those that have an ambiguous start, I'm able to predict them better than other types, which is perhaps not so surprising. But if I look to see across, you know, which of these am I detecting either a 10 seconds or 100 seconds before, across all of these brain states and seizure types, that's about 80% uh, of them, and if I need to detect in both 10 seconds and 100 seconds before the seizure, I'm doing that for about 50% of the seizures. So I think that's a, a reasonable kind of performance rate to begin to plug in as a, as a therapeutic. I ask my neurologist colleagues, how good does it need to be? And, and they don't know, but the, the current standard of care is a continuous stimulation. So you know, at least it's going to be better than that, and I don't miss, right? Um, I don't miss, at least, at least in this case. So these are the planned experiments. Um, where I'll have my uh, real-time seizure forecaster, and then I'll have some threshold, and then based off of when um, my predictor crosses that threshold, I'll stimulate the cholinergic midbrain and see if I can present, uh, uh, prevent upcoming seizures. And so all of the mechanics for these experiments work, um, but we just haven't done the experiments yet. And so that's going to be ongoing over the next several months in the lab. All right, so conclusions. Um, it looks like that the cholinergic midbrain stimulation can amel ameliorate epileptiform activity across the brain. Um, by inducing a neuroprotective, you know, I use REM-like state here, maybe. Um, and the seizure forecast is, is successful in detecting this pre brain state, and it's not for boring reasons. Yeah. So every study has its limitations, and I just want to be upfront about the limitations of my study. These inter from discharges are not seizures. You know, for this to be a nice, exciting preclinical finding for my neurologist colleagues, you know, we should be talking about seizures here. And so that's uh, ongoing experiments. But... The medications that treat the inter from discharges tend to work for seizures too. So there's some reason for hope. You know, this one <laughs> needs to be said. And um, the lateral dose of tegmental nucleus is a deep brain structure. And if you mess up doing your implants here, you can kill a person. You know, these nearby are nuclei that are involved in regulating breathing and, and heart rate and things like that. But as I mentioned, it's been targeted in people before for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. So it's not an impossible target for deep brain stimulation. And with this, I'd like to give my acknowledgments. Um, you know, we've got a new lab and this work has really been driven by technicians in the lab. So Davy Gregg um, designed uh, all of the kind of hardware for doing this kind of um, closed loop detection. Um, he built the systems, he's implanting the animals, he's a super duper technician who's gonna be applying for graduate school soon. 
Um, Alex Summer, uh, she's got a master's degree working in a different um, epilepsy model, and she's the lab manager has been really helping out on this project too. I've got a number of clinical collaborators. Um, I wanted to know if my seizure forecasting algorithms worked for people, and there was no public database of clinical EEG. And so I asked the head of the epilepsy clinic, can I mine every clinical EEG that's been recorded at the University of New Mexico? And she said, yes, and gave me the keys to the car. So we stripped out uh, 15,000 um, patients worth of EEG and put them into a, an open file format and de-identified for use of data mining purposes. Um, and um, this kind of work requires a lot of IT support. Um, Nick Casey helped me build my seizure database. Pascal Azawi, he runs the supercomputer um, at the University of New Mexico. And then I've got a number of external collaborators. Um, I've uh, Christos Lascaros, he collected the, the data from the mice that I used for my seizure forecasting. And he was working in Helen Scharfman's lab, who's really um, been a leader in the epilepsy field and has been an incredibly valuable mentor as I move into this new field out of learning and memory into the epilepsy field. And thank you very much for inviting me here for your attention. We, we got a few minutes for questions. Anybody have any? So you talked about how um, you with, with that kind of 10 second window of your prediction, sometimes it'll look like it's gonna have seizure and then it just doesn't. Is there some sort of like sub threshold stimulation that you can give to where you induce a seizure in that state or you wouldn't? Good question. We talked about this actually last night. Um, come to New Mexico, we'll do the experiments. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so. I, 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 I actually got anybody else. Sorry. Yeah. Um, anyone else have any questions for Dr. McKenzie? I know a lot of people have to get to class, et cetera. Nope. All right. Well, thank, well, thank him again. And I'll ask my questions after. <laughs>